Hey guys, welcome back to another fantastic episode of Project 11's Check-In, where we talk about all things mental health and wellness, and I'm here joined by my good friend, Susie Friesen. By the way, I'm Donna Merrill. <laughs> <laughs> hey Don, tell us, you are not in Winnipeg right now. How are you? And I'm where not, are you? The, the world is coming back to life. It's, it's really strange, you know. Um, I, uh, I am, I'm in Calgary right now. I was in Toronto earlier this week, and I'm it's strange, you know, kind of getting back at it. But at the same time, I looked at the numbers yesterday for Canada and the whole country right now, our COVID numbers, our COVID positivity rates is like 500. So it's it's unbelievable where we've come now, right? Whereas, you know, 500 was kind of where we were as a province not too long ago. And uh, and so, it, you know, it's, I'm, I've been fully vaccinated now too. And, and, uh, and it just feels like... People are being respectful and people being safe. I'm, I'm here in Calgary, not for Calgary Stampede. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I know there's a lot of, that was a really polarizing thing, right? People really want to do Stampede and really, people really don't. And um, mm -hmm. I, uh, I'm i not going to get into the political battle of that, but uh, a lot of my friends are playing at Stampede and it looks like it's okay. just been a crazy time. And, um, you know, I just hopefully everybody's being safe and good out there. But but yeah, back back on the road, back on planes and doing stuff. It's, it's kind of strange how, my hope is, is that we just don't slip back into sort of old behaviors without really recognizing what we've been through and how we hopefully will have grown through that and, and just really continue to respect each other's space, respect, you, you know, what's going on. I, I've had one cold this whole time. How about you? Have, you? have you been sick in all this? I have not. And I can't remember the last time I was sick or had a cold or anything. So I'm definitely going to keep being extra cautious. You know, even though we have our immunization cards, we know we can still get COVID or or pass it along. So we're going to be extra careful and especially around all of our little ones that are 12 and under who we know don't have the option to get a vaccine. So let's all just continue to really appreciate all the little things and moments that we get to be with everyone. You know, I've really been appreciating things opening up and us all being allowed to be with friends and family again and really don't want to go back into another lockdown. You know, we've been doing lots of camping with friends and family and the girls have just been really loving being with their friends, swimming at the lake or, you know, wherever we've been camping and it's been a nice change of scenery too. <laughs> Different than our, our backyard that we're used to. Um, even if our last trip, you know, had a ton of fish flies, we were still so grateful for, for being out camping. They're so tasty. Those so oh yeah. We had <laughs> great protein, great protein. So <laughs> them to snack. Uh, but no, just appreciating, you know, those little moments that we can be with friends or be with family. I know things are, are continuing to open up here. Um, yeah, just looking forward to and hoping that everything will will remain okay and that if there's a fourth wave that it's going to be very tiny and mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. by the way just uh for podcast listeners out there we do not condone the eating of fish flies that was a complete joke i just want to put that <laughs> disclaimer out there if you want to eat them i don't think that's probably going to hurt you but i I've never eaten one myself i did know a girl one time at a camp who she her friends would dare her and she would take them and and eat them and i just oh. thought that's so maybe that's why i thought of eating them but... no way really? yeah. <laughs> oh so listen on, on 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 that front maybe it's a really good time to introduce our guest okay. uh, <laughs> <laughs> um today we have somebody who's incredibly special to me he's somebody who i've looked up to for for years for the whole time i've been doing this music thing um his name is alan gray eyes he is a leader in the indigenous community here in, in this province and beyond he was the former um, director of the Indigenous Music Program here. Uh, formerly, that was the an Aboriginal Music Program, turned into the Indigenous Music Program. And, uh, and just somebody who's on the front lines of so many of these kinds of conversations we're having now um, about, you know, the Indigenous, non-Indigenous peoples coming together and, and figuring this thing out. And, um, you know, Alan is just such a, a wealth of knowledge. He is an incredibly uh, fantastic human being that I think you guys are really going to enjoy. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I can't say enough good things about this guy. And, and, I, and I know you're going to love this conversation with uh, with Alan and I. Mm -hmm. And you'll get to learn a little bit more about Don Amaro and his breakdancing days and arm wrestling days. I think <laughs> really enjoy 
And you'll notice too that I think, I don't know where in the conversation I realized I had a microphone, but I was just in awe listening to you both that I just wanted to listen to two friends catching up. I was happy as can can be just, uh, you know, seeing you two connect and learning from both of you. So it was a beautiful conversation and we're excited to share. So enjoy and thank you, Alan Gray Eyes. Hey friends, so today uh, we've got a, a great friend of mine. His name is Alan Gray Eyes. Uh, we were great buddies here in, in Winnipeg. And, and Alan is somebody who I have gotten to know over the last 15 or so years, uh, basically connected to the music industry. And he's been on the front lines of, of helping so many of us Indigenous artists grow and, and figure out how to you know, navigate the landscape of the music world. But Alan is also somebody who um, wears multiple hats as a leader uh, in, in the music community, uh, you know, not just in the Indigenous world. But, um, and I just wanted to introduce you to him and have an opportunity for Susie to meet my friend Alan and for you guys to hear from him. And so I'm going to turn it over to, to my good buddy, Alan, here. Hey, how you doing, Alan? Good. How are you, Don Romero? I am. Uh, I'm good. I'm. I'm. I, I'm double vaccinated now. Are you? Yes. Yes. We were yeah. fortunate enough to get vaccinated by Pegwes. It was yep. very, very quick, very uh, short lineups, and uh, I feel a lot safer now. I saw your Instagram. I saw you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it was great because also my son, he's 20 years old now. He was able to get vaccinated at the same time, as well as my wife Destiny, and so uh, the three of us adults in the household at least have our. Our, our immunizations now right right how about you Susie you got your first one right right last we spoke I had my first one I have had both vaccines now now Alan I have to say I'm so excited to have you on our podcast today I heard you speak with Don and two other friends in uh, John's music world and after listening I know I texted Don saying I know we have a long list of guests that we want to have on our show but we got to have Alan soon. So I'm really glad that you're able to join us here today. And I'm curious, how did you two initially meet? Um, I was actually just walking downtown and there was a, a young man who had a, a bunch of um, cardboard um, just laid out on the cement and he was doing some break dancing moves. And so I stopped and took some photos and turns out that was Don Romero. No way. And that, that was probably, that was probably 2011. <laughs> no way. <laughs> That's fake news, Alan Gray Eyes. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we met through Manitoba Music, actually, back in the early 2000s, probably 2005, 2006. And I think Don was a part of um, a number of programs that I was able to, to put together um, with Manitoba Music. And so we became friends through that process. Um, I've beaten him in arm wrestling a number of times, too. I'll put that on the record. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I've definitely had, we've, we've seen a lot of great things together. And so it's been a, a good, good run. I love that you got to throw that in there, Alan, that you beat me in arm rest. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Well, we'll get some video evidence of that someday. Um, so, so yeah, Alan and I, we met, met through the uh, Indigenous Music Program through Manitoba Music. And uh, what are you doing these days, Alan? You, you left that program a couple of years ago. Uh, and now, now what are you, what are you doing? Yeah, so um, I left, uh, I think it was 2018, and um, right now I'm running a, a little music festival here in Winnipeg. We take concerts to low-income neighborhoods throughout the Winnipeg's core and North End to give uh, Indigenous families the same access to the arts as our, our counterparts in suburban Winnipeg. And then I uh, also do some artist management and project management, and I'm working with um, Northern Cree, which is a a uh, nine-time Grammy-nominated powwow drum group out of Alberta, and uh, Kaylee Watts, who's an emerging singer-songwriter out of Bella Coola. You're a man wearing many hats in this world of music, and and uh, no, no, so that's that's just two hats. That's just well, still, I mean, I feel that, <laughs> that's true. That that is two hats. But you have you have many hats. I wore one of them when I sang the anthem at a Jets game one time. Oh, that's right. <laughs> my cousin, my cousin Kaya, she made a beaded Jets hat. And it was beautiful, except um, my head's really big. And so I, I don't fit it very well. But um, yeah, it's like um, a, a wonderful beaded Winnipeg Jets hat. And it's, uh, I think, yeah, I think the hat, hat got more screen time than I did that night. Oh, that my race. goodness. Yeah, yeah. It, it's beautiful. <laughs> I still have it. And actually, Destiny, my wife, Destiny, took me to a Jets game in Las Vegas for my birthday a couple of years ago. And she right. wore that hat because it was, again, too small for my head. Yeah. Did it get did it get on camera at all? You know, no, but we we rocked it really proud. I, I had my other Jets hat and we had our jerseys on and 
The Jets right. actually beat Vegas in Las Vegas on my birthday that year. It was awesome. What a gift. <laughs> That's awesome. So, Alan, I was going to ask you, you know, I mean, not to get right to the, to the hard questions right away, but I mean, obviously, I know this whole, our whole country is right now immersed in this deeper conversation about reconciliation. Um, you know, the, the TRC, I think that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, ended their work, I think it was six years ago. Um, and, uh, and so now they've, they've put the 94 calls to action in place. And so this conversation has used this word reconciliation a lot. Uh, in the last decade uh, and beyond, but but really, I feel like the unveiling of the 215 kids in in Kamloops and and um, and there's more being discovered. It seems by by the day now. I've I've seen a few other numbers come up on on on, on Instagram and hearing hearing people sharing about how they're being founded. So our our whole country right now, there's so many people going. It, it was it was kind of like people were hit over the head with something that they hadn't really confronted yet and. You know, indigenous peoples in this country have really been, um, you know, sharing these stories about the atrocities that have happened. But now it seems like this 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 new information has has sort of hit the non-indigenous community in a big way. I've been overwhelmed by conversations from people who from the non-indigenous community saying, what do we do? Um, you know, and and um, when, when you think of that right now, where does that um, is that? Has that stirred up anything for you in, in this, in the recent weeks? Um, no, not really. I think what, what really impacted me was Wab Canoe's book, The Reason You Walk. Yeah. And um, I didn't read it actually, but my wife did. And she sa- shared one story that his father shared with him. And it was about his best friend in residential school. And he, he went missing for, for uh, the morning or maybe it was in the afternoon. I can't rem- remember the exact details, obviously, because I didn't read it. But I think it's a, it's important to read it because it's an incredible book. Um, for me, it's more, it. yeah, for me, it's more personal because he's like one of my best friends and I just didn't want to like know him at that level. I think I know him on a personal level. And so I remember her telling me the story of Tabasonicwit's friend, um, not, he not being able to find him. And then he, when he did find him off, uh, away from the residential schools, he was surrounded by a bunch of white men and they were beating him. And this was a young boy. And so it was, uh, unfortunately, uh, a little later on, maybe it was a couple of days after the boy died because of that beating that he took from those grown men. And mm-hmm. I think for me, that that's really when I started to internalize what Canada's real past was and um, what, what, you know, we're still surrounded by some of those men that, that did those atrocities and commit those acts of violence. And so, again, that, that gave me an opportunity to internalize that and come to terms with it and to, and to d- make a decision on how I'm going to act and how I'm going to make the world a better place. And so I think like mm-hmm. the, the discovery of the 250 children um, is, is, is serving as that moment for a lot of Canadians now. And I think that's really important. Well, and that's, that's been my thinking through this whole thing is I feel like it's, it's turned the eyes and ears of, all Canadians towards this. And, and I feel like I want, you know, you and I, Alan, and we've been on the front lines of having these conversations for years, it seems. And, and I feel like now is an opportunity for us to really, you know, using a term that you use, amplify these thoughts and ideas that we have in terms of, because people are leaning in more than ever before. And so you said something a second ago where, where you thought you, you could, um, you know, uh, create positive change or something to that effect. You said a moment ago, what, what do you, what do you do, Alan? How do you feel like what, 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 what you can do to, to create some change? For me, it's about figuring out the root of, of the issues and being able to synthesize it and, and say it in, in really sound bite and understandable ways. And so I do that when I'm speaking on panels or when, when I'm involved in committees and board work. And mm. then I also share it with artists like yourself because I do believe that you know, every stage gives us an opportunity to, to educate Canadians and to show Canadians that Indigenous people are just as special and unique as their loved ones. And so mm. if artists are able to share the, the, the sound bites that I, that, I, that I share with them, then I think like that message, again, gets amplified and get multiplied and it reaches more people. And so that's what I'd really try to do is, is I've made the decision, you know, I don't really want to be the one front and center. I really consider myself as more of a transitional generation. 
Um, and my kids are going to make a bigger impact and the artists that I'm connected with are, are also going to have a bigger impact. Hmm. That's beautiful. And I, say, and, and I say transitional because I really, I'm still learning. Um, residential schools bit, really had a hard impact on my family. We, we don't um, have the language in, in our family. We have some uncles that were uh, joined the family through marriage that have some of the teachings and are ceremonial people. But you know what? My, my mom doesn't have it. My grandparents didn't have it. My dad's family definitely didn't. And so, yeah, th that was like conscious decisions by our grandparents, but by my grandparents to, you know, not teach the language, not teach the ceremonies. And uh, the idea was to give their children and grandchildren a better chance to succeed in, in the Canadian economy, mm. which is, which is hard. Like, cause you know, language really informs your worldview and the beautiful thing about Anishinaabe, one of the most beautiful things that I've learned about Anishinaabe, our language, is that it's, um, I think it's around 80% verbs, not a lot of nouns. And so within that worldview, you're always describing people by what they're doing and, and not freezing them as a noun. So you don't say that person's a racist. You describe mm -hmm. that their action. And when you're describing them, that gives them the freedom to change. That gives them the freedom to be a better person, to become mm -hmm. a better person. And so I think, you know, we've lost a lot of those teachings and those philosophies and worldviews by not being able to um, practice our, 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 our language and share it with our, with our children and grandchildren. Mm, I'm so glad you're here, man. You're, you're offering so much, so much knowledge and wisdom in this area already that I think a lot of people are going to find really valuable. That's great, man. And I, I learned that, like, more verbs. I heard that from Susan Blight at a talk at the University of Toronto during one of the trips we had with Manitoba Music. I think you were actually um, on that trip, and that might have been the trip where I beat you in arm wrestling. But I snuck <laughs> away, and I went and saw Susan Blight talk. And I mean, right. like she, she is like a thought leader, uh, our, our generation too, and uh, yeah, Anishinaabe thought leader. And I think like one of the things I realized, again, going back to Wab Canoe and his family, I remember seeing his father speak at the University of Winnipeg. And before seeing him speak, and this was probably when I was like 18 or 19, before he hearing him speak, I totally didn't realize that the Anishinaabe had philosophy, the Anishinaabe had science, they had arts, they had all of the richness that we, we usually accredit to the Romans or the Greeks or, you know, any European nations that, that were taught in school. And so it was incredible to see him speak and to like dispel a lot of those myths and to, and to reestablish and reaffirm the humanity of, of Anishinaabe and indigenous people. Mm. And yeah, yeah, like, and yeah, Wob was like, it was incredible meeting Wob too. And I was I, like, I met him when he was 17. I think I was 19 and I was so envious of him because he had such a cool dad and like, my, <laughs> like this, to see someone's dad get up there in a university setting and like take on all these professors and take on all right. these ignorant questions and field them like just they, 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 they fell off of him like water off of a duck's back. And it was yeah. incredible to see like a Anishinaabe person standing up there being just as articulate and thought provoking as, as our, our um, professors and, and thought leaders across Canada. I can. Only, I, I had a chance to meet Wob's dad. I think once uh, at an event, and I know exactly what you mean. Like he, uh, there was this. He, 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 he. There was a this aura about his presence, and um, he, he actually, if I remember correctly, his dad met the Pope and, and handed him an eagle feather. Right? Is that was that a yeah. true story? Yeah, yeah, Wob and his dad have met some incredible people, including mm -hmm. President Obama, um, the Pope, um, uh, Nelson Mandela. So I mean. I, I, like I see, like I, I want to give my kids the same opportunities and the same kind of uh, experience or worldview that Wob had um, growing up as well. That being well, said, you... like that being said, though, like I do think like Wob definitely had his challenges um, as a young man growing yeah. up with a residential school survivor, and, uh, and I can't speak on his behalf. And maybe he talks about it in his book, but yeah, he uh, does. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't imagine that's, that's an easy process either or an easy relationship to have. Well, you make a really good point. You know, you saw, you know, at, at a relatively young age for you, like seeing, seeing uh, Wob's dad speak and, and eloquently and, and, and being able to go toe to toe with it, you know, and, and in, in terms of, of, of 
being in amongst a crowd of people who really probably haven't seen somebody like that. And you saw it and it ignited. It seems like the way you're speaking to me, it seems like it ignited this like fire inside of you to be somebody who is also like that out there sort of speaking good things into the world and, and, and on behalf of the indigenous communities and just saying, um, just like you say, dispelling some of those myths that that's huge. Yeah. And so, so you talk about this all the time too, about, you know, indigenous people, um, being able to see themselves in, in, in the success of, of, you know, the, the society right now. Right. And so when, and it, when you talk about, um, athletics, when you talk about leadership and seeing indigenous people in those roles, I think is really great because, um, it ignites more fires in the young people that are seeing, seeing themselves up there in those roles. Yeah. I, I watched a tribe called red or what they're called the hallucination now, but they had a video recently, maybe it was last week. And, um, Bear Witness said something about bringing young Indigenous people on stage helps them realize that the gap between them and um, and success is is actually a lot narrower than than what they had imagined. Right. And so I think that we can do something similar through like what you do on stage, what what I tell to my kids, or what I share um, in board meetings and and, and other panel discussions. Mm. This is great. I feel like we could almost like just let you go for, for an hour and you just have so many great ideas and thoughts that you could share with us. It's I'm really appreciating all this. No, no, I'm not good at just presenting. I think like, <laughs> I, and that might be a cultural thing too. Like I, I'm not good at just talking at people. I like to be in conversations and I, and I yeah. think like what I've also seen through the school system and, and even what we do at, with concert halls and music festivals is the idea that, you know, there's one person at the head of the classroom or the one person on stage or a group on stage and the rest of us are asked, asked to sit quietly and watch. And um, that style doesn't work for everyone. And I think it's right. important to note that, like, I don't succeed in that situation either. I want the ability to ask questions. I want the ability to make contributions to the conversation too. So I think uh, it, it might be a cultural thing. And, and that's one of the reasons I think a lot of indigenous um, students don't succeed in the industrial, industrialized classrooms or the assembly line school system. The idea that we put somebody in the system at kindergarten, like put them through the entirely same process as everyone else and have them come out exactly the same at at the end of grade 12, I don't think it works for everyone. And, and I think, again, that's an, a cultural trait that we've, we've lost through um, residential schools. Mm. Yeah, I, I think about that point all the time. You mentioned that when, in our conversation a couple of weeks ago. And, and you know, we, I was talking to you about my son and how he's struggling with school. And I mean, so many are right now, obviously, in the midst of the pandemic, lockdown and remote learning and stuff. And, um, and, and you said, you know, school is not for everyone. You know, it's not going to be the same for every kid. And you know, you, you were encouraging me saying, you know, he'll find success, you know, outside of the school. And, and, uh, you know, sometimes the systems uh, put in place are not for everyone. I think that's a real, real truth to that. I was going to ask yeah. you, Alan, though. So I like what you said, like, so when you're at one of my concerts, do you want me to ask you like, hey, Alan Gray, do you have any questions? No, that- no. But I think like, again, <laughs> particip- the, the classroom setting or when we uh, replicate the classroom for our concerts, I mean, it's, it's the best way to deliver a message to hundreds, if not thousands of people at any given time. But again, it's not, right. it's not the right setting for a lot of people who don't want to sit quietly and listen. I think there, there is a movement, especially within the folk festivals, people like to get up and dance. People yeah. at ho- hockey games like to get up and cheer. But again, when we're asking people to sit quietly and watch, um, it's, it's, it's a request that doesn't, that doesn't connect with a lot of people. And so for me, I mean, the participatory model of, of music presentation that, that works is the powwows for first nations and the prairies. Like it's, 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 a, a like a, an event where you can, you know, you can sit in the stands, you can sit in the arbor, or you can dance in intertribal, or you can go and stand next to the drum while they're singing or you can get up and walk around the outside of the arbor and shop or get food and visit with loved ones. And so it's not that classroom where you're, you're forced to just sit quietly and listen. Mm-hmm. Well, and powwows are open to everybody. Any and everyone's invited, right? Like it's not just yep. for indigenous people. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah. There's a lot of people like when, when, when we get back to powwows after the pandemic, there's a lot of people that, that come and watch cause it's, it's open. Usually there's, Usually it's free. Some of them charge for parking, but um, yeah. And then you, it's a good idea to bring cash because I always buy a lot of like beadwork or t-shirts yeah. or 
or French fries and yeah. lemonade, just like well, when think, you go to the beach. I think that's what people don't recognize. Like, like I think people think powwow is is this ceremonial type of thing, whereas whereas there it's it's kind of like a, like a like a festival in a way, right? It's got that sort of festival feel. That's definitely what it is. It's it's a, a more participatory model for music presentation. Right, like you say, with food trucks and lemonade and 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 all these kinds of stuff. So I think that's that's important for people to know that and that it's it's a real just communal thing and. And, you know, when we talk about reconciliation, I always say it's about relationships. So I think one of the great ways to do that is maybe when you find out if there's a powwow happening, go check it out and spend some time well, and, and I learn. think it, it, it'd be really cool to see Mark Shifley up there dancing in intertribal or Nikolai Ehlers <laughs> or, you know, I think, yeah, it's beautiful when, when Paul, we see people, Paul Maurice, uh, yeah. Paul Maurice. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, these are, these are opportunities to show people that you're just the same as them. And, and yeah. I think, uh, yeah, that's, that's an important message. And and like I said, like we like Bear Witness said, um, it shows kids that the gap between them and success is is a lot narrower than what they thought it was. Okay, so we'll make sure that that Paul Maurice and, and Nick and Mark <laughs> listen to that part of, of this of this episode. They've been called Every, out. Yeah, no, we'll call call to action for sure. And Alan will arm wrestle each of them too, just to see if he can keep his championship <laughs> going. Oh. I, I I got I got that one, Don Romero. Don't worry. <laughs> Oh my goodness, you guys, you know, listening to you speak, Alan, I'm reminded of my years teaching and the division I had taught in, I found to be really thoughtful and progressive. And I really appreciated its diverse options in terms of languages that it offered. You know, one of its schools offers a kindergarten to grade five uh, bilingual program for students in Ojibwe. And I think they still have various other language classes um, some might be just after school options, but just preserving languages and your heritage is just so important. And I remember when my colleagues and I would plan to teach about residential schools or when we'd invite an elder to speak with our students, it was just so important for us to have our students learn about where we live and what's happened and why we need to be respectful and celebrate each other's diverse background. And I know that I had the privilege to spend a lot of time specifically with Elder Mary Crushane, who who's an inspiring thought leader here in Manitoba. And, and once we actually were presenting together in, in Florida, and it was such a blessing to hear um, her stories and, and to really listen and and it's important to listen to each other's stories. And I'm grateful to learn and listen to you today, Alan, and know that you're really going to have a positive impact on our listeners. And I hope whoever is listening is at a place where they're feeling able to embrace their own culture and all the things that make us unique in this diverse world and that we can all be united together. You know, I, I know I've shared with Dawn about the guilt that I had. And when thinking about my parents coming to Canada from their villages in Portugal, and as much as they didn't know the language or know the history of Canada and know when they were raising me in the eighties here and in Winnipeg, or when my mom first moved to Thompson, Manitoba, not knowing residential schools were still open. And I, you know, I, I feel guilt around my parents, you know, they were able to preserve their language and their culture here and it was an adjustment to learn English. And, and you know, now it's being shared in the news about the church and the hypocrisy there, you know, just has me really reflecting a lot. I know my family that there's there's a bit of trauma connected to the church that that affects generations. And I, I can understand that. And I know that for me, I was really privileged to have a positive experience for myself going to church or catechism, but I know in my family, you know, that wasn't always the case. And I know for other families that wasn't all the case. So, you know, with that guilt, I need to focus on what I can control today in 2021 and, and need to continue to learn and listen. And, and I, I shared in our last episode that I started that Indigenous Canada course out of UVA. And I know that I have a safe space with my colleagues, Carrie and Anjali, who both also happened to be uh, Métis as well. And for us to be able to talk openly about diversity and inclusion and amplify, you know, that message through work, through our work with Project 11 means the world to us. And, but I, I know not everyone has that safe space, but I know, or I hope with the increased awareness this past while, I hope more and more people will be better allies and, and support one another and take this momentum 
and keep it going sustainably. That's a really important point, Susie. I know you got something to say there, Alan, but I'm, I'm just going to just jump in here for just a second because I think one of the things that you're saying is, is that there's a lot of people that feel like, I don't know what to do. I hear this news. I feel this, you know, this guilt because when you think of the generations and, and, and where do I fit in this? And I think the key thing is, is that it, uh, I, most people that I know would not have committed the atrocities that would have happened all those years ago, you know, generations ago and, and in, in even generations to now. But I think the, 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 the thing is, is what you're talking about is, is education is key. And I think people feeling like you can either be complicit or you can be ignorant or you can educate. And I think those are, that's what people are, are finding their way through now is going, okay, do I want to be complicit? Do I want to be ignorant? Or do I want to be educating myself and understanding the history of this country? Because once you do that, I don't think you can ignore your attitude moving forward. Yeah. And I, I, I'm a believer that all the little things add up. And so while we don't have a lot of people who are still committing the same atrocities that happen in residential schools, we still see like the Barbara Kettner situation, like the murder of Barbara Kettner when that guy threw a, a, a trailer hitch from a moving vehicle. We still see Joyce Eshwishan being denied um, health care by nurses in, in Quebec. I mean, these situations are documented, but the undocumented ones are still happening on a regular basis. And yeah. I think Winnipeg a couple of years ago was named the most racist city in Canada. And it's for a good reason. And that racism still exists today. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it is an ongoing battle. And that's why I really appreciate the work of True North and the Winnipeg Jets, because I think like I always consider um, hockey is one of the only professional sports that's still dominated by white athletes. And so when you have that, I think we have a larger audience uh, that is, is predominantly white in hockey as well, because they see themselves in the athletes that are performing or, or competing. And so that gives us an opportunity to educate all those people. And so when True North stands up, when the Winnipeg Jets stand up and say, you know what, we're going to normalize Indigenous culture, we're going to continue to have land acknowledgements, we're going to take it a step further and have programming as well. I think that sends a message to Canadians that, you know, you need to get on board as well and start to put in the same work that we are. And uh, I think that it also extends to the Edmonton Oilers. When, when we swept them in four games, that was incredible. <laughs> and then I think we saw the Edmonton Oilers fans blaming Ethan Bear for a lot of that, which is understandable. Like, he's a young defenseman. I think his, his, his real skills lie in, in the offensive end of the, of the ice. But, um, again, a lot of races, racism came out when, when, when they put him – you know, they blamed him for a lot. And so it extended not only for his, from his play, but his, his race and the fact that he is Cree. And so I think um, they, the Edmonton Oilers took the opportunity to, to also educate their, their fans and their audience. And I think that's an important thing that, um, that we're, we're starting to see we can rely on these um, NHL teams and these, these organizations to help out in this battle to, uh, a battle against racism, battle against stereotypes, and the the and the movement to educate um, people that we're just as special and unique as their loved ones. Mm. That's very true, my friend. I was going to say too, you know, with um, there's there's always like everybody's different. Everybody has a different attitude towards this. There are some, you know, in the, in the indigenous community that come and they have they have fire in their heart and they have their fists raised and they're angry and they're pounding the table and they. They, they, they're demanding change and they're and they're 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 doing it in a way that is not the way I do it. It just doesn't it doesn't my, my spirit doesn't have that same sort of um, fight in me. I, I, I've always been on this side of like, let's let's it's through loving and kind relationships that we can truly make change. I think I think if I if I slam the table and tell my kids to do something, they might do it. But, you know, they, they won't necessarily do it again next time. But if they know it's an act of love towards each other, I think I think that can create more change. We have an open and it, it takes time. It takes a lot of time, those loving conversations to really have my children kind of go, oh, OK, I get this. This is an act of love towards each other. I wanted to ask you, Alan, because I, a number of people after my, our conversation a couple of weeks ago said to me, I just really loved hearing Alan speak. And he just it came across in such a, a way that I I, I felt like um, it was open and honest and it was. You're, you're smiling. You were smiling from ear to ear for most of it, which, <laughs> yeah. which, which is kind of the Alan Gray eyes look. Um, and, and I think that you do that and, you, and it's so inviting to say, like you said a, a little while ago, you, you appreciate conversation. And I think what 
what is that in you that 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 you feel like is open to that as opposed to slamming a table and saying I, this needs to change right now and 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 if Steve, this doesn't happen then we're going to start a riot <laughs> you know? well I, I gotta i gotta say that we stand on the shoulders of giants and a lot of people who actually did do the the putting their bodies on the line, putting up barricades and blockades to get their voices heard, and to also introduce the, the, the atrocities that happened at residential schools. This wasn't always an easy path. And so now we are, we are very comfortable. Don and I, we are sitting from the comfort of our homes talking about these things, educating people who want to listen. Uh, the Winnipeg Jets are, are educating people from the comfort of their hockey arenas and offices. And so we're not on the front lines. We're not in danger of, of starving to death. Our children are not at, at risk of physical harm. And so, like, uh, again, uh, I see it as like a, an opportunity to do good without putting my life on the line. And so that's what, uh, again, we, we only, we're only in this situation because people actually did those things. People did put their lives on the lines. And so, um, yeah, I wanted to acknowledge those folks because I know, you know, this hasn't always been an easy road, as easy as it is now. I got chills, man. I had not really considered that before. The fact that the road that you and I walk is paved because they they put the stones down. You know, they've they've enabled you guys like you and me to be able to have these kinds of platforms that we have, and that's that is so rich, man. I, I really well, appreciate that thought. I'll talk about Wob again, and I remember I always remind him this about this as well as when the issue of residential school was first being um, raised and the CBC was starting to cover it, Wob was working there and um, he might not want me to share the story, but I'm going to share it anyway. And uh, they told him he couldn't refer to residential school survivors as survivors. The CBC wanted, uh, maybe it was just the local CBC wanted him to say residential school students. And so he actually took a hard line and threatened to quit if, if that's what they were going to force mm -hmm. him to do. And so, again, like there have been people who put their careers on the line, like Wob and his ability to feed his family um, just to get to this point that we're at now. Right. It, did, it does take the, the taking a stand for sure. I, uh, I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, I, I just, again, grateful for that perspective. Um, Alan, what do you do to stay so positive? Like, what are you doing for your mental health these days? Like, what's your because you. I've never seen you lose your cool. I mean, I've watched you over the last 10, 15 years and you've never like in the midst of a storm of whatever's going on and, you know, even just organizational stuff, uh, you know, maybe you fall apart once you walk out of the room, but, but like, I've never seen you ever sort of, sort of, you know, I, I have all this gray hair. You have none. I don't know what you're doing to, to stay, some. stay the way. Okay. Okay. Good. <laughs> but, uh, but like, you're just, yeah, you're just so level, man. So what do you do to keep, keep yourself balanced? Um, well, I got, the support of my wife, Destiny, she's really great. And um, we talk about these things all the time. We prepare each other for moments when we're extremely busy. And I often say that when I'm taking care of um, dozens of people, if not hundreds of people, she's the one person who's taking care of me. And so she's bringing me lunch and she's um, not putting messages in my calendar to remember to eat lunch but she's bringing lunch to me. <laughs> when I texted you guys that screenshot of my schedule to confirm that our podcast schedules were aligned, Alan noticed where it said on the schedule, um, Susie, eat lunch that Kyle had put in my schedule, uh, which, you know, working from home together this year, he did notice how sometimes I'd work through lunch and end up eating it so late in the day. <laughs> so that's what happened there. Destiny doesn't do that for me, but she, she'll bring me lunch when I'm on site at a concert or something like that, or bring me dinner. And uh, so that helps. And I think like, um, we're for, like super fortunate to live in a home with, with each other. Like we have our kids here. And at the beginning of the pandemic, we made the decision to, to not really um, uh, force ourselves to keep up with the expectations of the schools. And we decided to you know, make memories during the pandemic as opposed to stress each other out and try to keep up with what was assigned. And so that's been an uh, extremely uh, good way of, of maintaining Saturday during the pandemic. Um, and mm -hmm. just like overall, I think it's, it's been like coming to terms with what, what's happened in the past um, to our people, but also to me personally, 
and um, trying to understand that, why it happened, why those things happened, and what I can do to, to not repeat those cycles. Because I think like, especially when it comes to abuse of any sort, it is a cycle, it is a cycle that repeats itself when you're, you're, you're abused and oftentimes you abuse others. And so I've worked really hard to break those cycles of abuse personally. So it's, um, again, like I said, it's, uh, it's being willing to do the work to understand it and then do the work to be a better person. And the other thing I should note uh, is that we're super fortunate to have a Peloton and I ride the Peloton almost every day. I was going to ask you, what you gymming it up? You still doing, uh, you still working those pipes so you can continue to beat me in arm wrestling? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we work out, we have a, a workout area in our basement. And so my son's 20 years old and he, I actually pay him $20 a, an hour to train my younger daughters who are nine and 10. And so they train every day. Destiny trains every day. I train every day. And it's, it's about like me, not like, like being athlete athletes or anything it's about like relieving stress and making mm. sure that we're just as like our physical health um often leads to our 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 mental health as well and so mm -hmm. yeah we take those little steps on on a regular basis to to stay stay healthy awesome Smart do you guy. Have a peloton instructor yeah i'd say tunde oyane is probably probably my favorite there's um the, I think the key with a Peloton instructor is somebody who's really personable, but also is a good dancer. And Tunde has got good rhythm, whereas some of them don't really have good dance moves. Are you trying to say I should be a Peloton instructor? Donna Merrill, you could probably you could probably do it, Donna Merrill. <laughs> yes, bring out your break dancing skills. Yeah, yeah. On the bike? I, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, just uh, give me one of those. I don't know. Um, hey, I was going to say, if you had uh, to recommend, a, I know you're an audio book guy. Um, is there any uh, books that you would recommend to folks these days that they should, you know, if they want to kind of uh, understand a little bit more of, of the of the indigenous history in this country, and or I shouldn't say indigenous history, the history of this country, and uh, and things that you found really enlightening and, and has, has helped you over the last little while. You know what, I'm, I listen to audio books on all issues. And so I don't have a favorite one that will really dig into the history of residential schools or the impact. I'd say like, again, this being like, I haven't read Wav's book, but I heard it's really good. So I would recommend yeah. um, reading uh, The Reason You Walk by, by Wav Canoe. I think that's a really great one. Um, yeah. or, or at least that's what I heard. My favorite book in the world is Between the World and Me by ta Coates. And mm -hmm. it's about the black experience in America with racism. It's a kind of a, it's written uh, from his perspective as a letter to his son. And it's helped me really to articulate and understand and then articulate points um, about racism and why it exists and, and, and how, it, how it works um, on, a, on a daily basis from the microaggressions to the, to the overt actions. And so again, I, I love Between the World and Me by ta Coates. And it's only about eight and a half hours to listen to, maybe even yeah. less. So I probably listened to it about 10 times now. Well, you've mentioned that book in, in a couple of weeks ago too. And so I think you've mentioned it now a couple of times that I, I really should dig into that book because uh, that's where the line, you know, it, you can't shoot a man and blame him for bleeding came from. Yeah, from yeah. So ta just in, in his rebuttal to the media's um like, uh, I don't know, the media saying that black on black crime was the real issue. Um, his rebuttal was that, you know, you can't shoot a man and then blame, blame him for, for bleeding. And again, that's really the case with us as well. Like our grandparents were, were, were shot. Our, our parents were shot, metaphorically speaking. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's happening now with, with uh, like incarceration rates, dropout rates, uh, the the, the apprehension of our children, like these are all because our grandparents and parents were, were abused. And not only that, like they were raised by people that didn't show them love. And so when they became parents, they didn't know how to show love either or how to invest in their children or raise their children. And so that was the systemic destruction of our families. And it's, and, and it is a hard path to take to try and build that strength up again. 
Yeah. Well, I, I mentioned that too a couple weeks ago, the, the generational trauma that we talk about. And then, you know, and what's happening when you talk about those, you know, the incarceration rates and the dropout rates, that's the bleeding happening, right? And so, um, you know, the opposite of generational trauma, and you mentioned was genera- generational wealth and how if you really take a deep look at, you know, you go back seven, eight generations ago and you follow that trail and you can see why the Indigenous communities have suffered and continue to suffer because of that trauma and why many in the non-Indigenous community have, have continued to gain because they're following this path of wealth. And, um, you know, well, right back to, to, to when we talk about where, where Indigenous people were allocated to land and just not the land wasn't rich. You know, it was, there was no opportunities to develop. And, uh, and all that's, that's a really strong point to, to have to consider when you look at the history. Well, it's not only generational wealth, it's generational justice. And uh, I think, yeah, mm-hmm. justice is, I, I think justice is, is definitely the opposite of, of poverty and definitely the opposite of trauma. Yeah. Mm. Valuable, valuable stuff here, man. I, Alan, I, I so appreciate you always, man, for, uh, for, you know, always willing to share, share your thoughts and, and helping us sort of sort through them ourselves. And I think you're a voice that, that I think many, um, when they hear you speak, you, you open up some new doors and pathways for us. So uh, just grateful for, for you having uh, set some time away for us today, man, and, and, and educating us a little bit more on how to, how to walk through this process a bit. Thanks, Don Romero. Thank you so My much, pleasure. Alan. Really appreciate having you here with us today. Yeah, Susie, thanks, thanks again for the invite. And, and folks, uh, I think what we're going to do is we're going to have a public arm wrestle, Alan and I, and we're going we're gonna to invite you all down someday just to see where we're at and see if he can still beat me. I just think it's worth, <laughs> worth going back there. Well, Don, Don, why don't I give you a good six months to try and work out and uh, build up some more strength, and then we can do that, okay? Because I, I, don't, I don't think there's any value in me embarrassing you publicly. <laughs> <laughs> well okay i appreciate the the window you know my christmas show is in about six months do you think we should have a small arm wrestling competition on stage at my christmas show <laughs> and i i don't want to embarrass you publicly that's not my goal i want i want to lift you up Don. i want people to think that you're just as fantastic as they imagined i'm really offended that you're saying you're beating me you're publicly here <laughs> oh man okay besides the arm wrestling thing alan i so appreciate you man and and i I just say hello to your family for us um and uh you know always us here you're always you're always a friend here so um you're always welcome back on anytime thanks for checking in buddy thanks don romero thanks Susie. thank you oh man that alan graz he is a gem of a human being and an incredible arm wrestler uh apparently uh <laughs> and uh i'm just i'm just so grateful for him because like i say he's just somebody who's so well educated has has really done a lot of deep thinking about you know how to 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 talk about some of the um relational issues sometimes between indigenous and non indigenous people and trying to figure out um how we can step into more sp- positions of unity and, and finding ways to to create that you know Susie and I were just talking a, a little while ago uh, off air about how you know what we're really hoping to do with with these kinds of conversations is create space for uh, bringing people together and just allowing people to really kind of hear and, and listen in deeper to to these conversations and, and, and hopefully I think that once you hear somebody's story it becomes a little bit easier to kind of understand where they're coming from mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I like what you said about how we all have the choice to either be complacent or ignorant or or we can continue to educate ourselves. And I think we all want to be lifelong learners. I think I've told you before, Don, that I went to a Ukrainian bilingual elementary school, a Hebrew bilingual middle school, and then a French immersion high school. And although, you know, many of the kids I grew up with and many of my friends, their parents or grandparents immigrated here. And we know many people that have come to Canada you know, everyone has their own stories, but it's important to know about the story about where we live today, right? And and there were Indigenous people who weren't allowed to be Indigenous and celebrate their language and culture. So there's just, well, you know, so much work to be done in terms of reconciliation. I think I've been saying, Susie, I, I wanted to share this too, as you know, as you shared yeah. about being complicit ignorant or educated yeah. and continuing to educate um 
I, I, I shared this last week in a, in a, I do these things these days called Monday Minute with Dawn on my social media channels. And I said this because I think a lot of people are hearing the news of these children across mm-hmm. the country that they're finding in these uh, in these grave sites. And, mm-hmm. um, and I said, you could be heartbroken at this news, you know, heartbroken at the racist and, and atrocities of our history, and yet still be complicit in the systems that are built on that hate and racism. And that's a that's a tough thing to work your head around, you know, because it's it's really about taking action, you know, and, and, and making sure that you're doing your part. And I, I'm quick to say this is that, you know, we're not asking any individuals to be the entire change. We're just, I think, asking everybody to, to kind of play their part and in this word reconciliation and whatever that means to you. And and, uh, and you know, this I, I shared this last week is, is the don't do nothing. Right. Like be, be heartbroken. Right. Mm-hmm. But but don't do nothing. Like I think that what, what the response needs to be is it's a, it's a kind of a call to action. And uh, and I hope that people are taking the time to educate and and read read the calls to action. Right. And, and figure mm-hmm. out where you fit in that. And and, and, and if, the, if you're passionate about a certain lane or avenue or something, I think you got to pursue that. Meanwhile, things around you are going to be crumbling and other things are going to go wrong. But I think you have to decide I'm going to this is this is why I'm here. I'm supposed to be doing this thing. And and, you know, I'm, I'm doing a certain thing that I feel like is helping and building something. Meanwhile, other things around me sometimes could be falling apart. And I and I have to just kind of stay focused on, on, on the gifts that I've been given and and how I can use those to make life better for everybody here in this country. And if anybody listening is looking for a book to read or listen to, I know that Alan, I think you shared a couple suggestions. And I know the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, their websites, they have an education section there. And I know um, uh, if if you're looking for more resources. And I know that I've mentioned the Indigenous Canada course. And I've shared a couple books from my book club in the past and some great children's books, I think, in our last episode. Um, but our Project 11 team, we've compiled uh, more. I, I don't know if they're accessible through our website or if they're in the password protected part. I'll have to look into that. Um, but if there's anything we can highlight or share with you, remember Don and I are happy to help you in your journey of learning. We're we're learning too. That's so true. As as we always say too, we just want to say we appreciate you guys out there for listening because that's why we do this. You know, we, we hopefully that you're 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 gaining a little bit of uh, you know experience through us and uh, an education that we're getting at the same time. And I was going to ask you, Susie, have you done that that uh, Indigenous course through the U of Alberta? Yeah, you know I wanted to see what section I'm on because I oh you're in it. Okay, to, cool. Yeah, so Kyle and I started. My phone's on airplane mode right now. Um, I'd like to do it too. I, I haven't. My, my manager's actually doing it right now, and oh. uh, I'd like to do it too, just because I feel like I want to have the, the the best sort of scope. And and I think if we all sort of kind of got went through the same sort of education process, I think it does sort of level the playing field a little bit. And to call it a playing field seems weird, but but mm-hmm. so that we're all sort of under, have the same sort of knowledge, right? And I think that's part of our problem is that. Again, we've talked about this before, how the education system failed and didn't really teach us the truth of this. And um, and the leaders at the time didn't funnel that through to the education system. And so, um, you know, I think it'd be really great if we all sort of ended up with that same understanding of our history. And I think that that allows us to really sort through how to change for, for, for a better future, you know, so. Yeah, it's important for us to learn about each other and about our history and, you know, just everything that's going on right now we all need to be digging a little bit deeper and and be more aware of what's what's happening uh now and and what has already happened i know growing up we learned a lot about world war one and world war ii and i remember visiting auschwitz the concentration camp in poland and all of these pieces are devastating and hard to learn about but if we learn about those heartbreaking parts in history or you know about Canada um, and even about the challenging pieces that still exist today around racism. Um, we, you know, it'll help us all have a better understanding and have empathy and help us create unity and supporting one another in, in the world that we live in today. Um, but yeah, first steps. Uh, I guess I'm glad I heard about that Indigenous Canada course from Dan levy of all people but um i I remember initially thinking when i heard about it from him in the fall 
um, that I'll have to do that one day. But when May came around, I just thought, okay, I'm not waiting anymore. I'm signing up now. Let's let's make that our challenge. Like I know for me, you know, I, I probably can't get into it right away just because of yeah. where I'm at and what's going on. But let's put that challenge out there for ourselves and we'll challenge people out there. You know, we don't usually yeah. do this. We ask you to challenge yourself, but let's put a challenge out there to say, let's let's all of us take this this course and because it's it's an elective course right you can kind of take it at your own time and yeah. and but i think and you know we keep talking about this free. educating yourself yeah, yeah it's free and, yeah. yeah i know we we donated to the u of a and um but you yeah it's free so it's accessible so yeah and it's taken it at your own pace yeah for sure mm-hmm. yeah so that's that's the challenge this week let's 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 say that's what it is and uh i, I will i will be diving in soon um, yeah, and, and and as always, you guys, thank you so much for um, for being part of this and being part of our our chats and conversations. And you know, as Susie said, she mentioned the email uh, project one one at what is it? E-S-E. I should know this. E dot com. And Don, if we follow you on Instagram, we'll see where you're going after Calgary and what you're up to in August. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm it's. It's. This has kind of been a busy week, but now we're sort of going to go into summer vacation camping mode too okay. uh, this next week and then uh I, I may sort of it may be a quieter august for me it's kind of been really busy up right up until now um and then uh and then things pick up yeah kind of starting later august and into the fall it's, it's going to be kind of crazy but uh mm-hmm. but the kind of crazy i've been longing for for the past year and a half so <laughs> oh it's all going to be yeah. good and we'll all look forward to seeing alan gray eyes at your christmas show so uh yeah. <laughs> you can referee yeah sounds good yeah. Uh, okay well take care everybody and you stay safe Don fly home safe I'm going to try my best um, thanks you guys and thanks for always checking in mm-hmm.